So today we're going to look at this Fluke 845AB High Impedance Voltmeter slash Null Detector. I've got no idea if this works. I know it's got this weird plug on the back which is going to be a problem to start with because I need to somehow get power and to even work on it and test it. That will need to be changed. It seems to be in reasonably good condition. It did have some sticker residue on it already which I've already cleaned off a little bit. There were some like, cattle stickers around the place. You know, residue from leftover ones. Cleaned that off already. Last calibration here is from Tetronix in 2011. 12 years ago is the last time this is calibrated. So it's still in use 12 years ago, which is quite good I suppose. I'm not sure what year this is, I think it's in the 60s. I'm not actually sure, maybe there'll be a date inside it somewhere. But the serial number here is 2785009. So maybe someone knows from the serial number what year that is. I don't know, maybe. So I don't know if you can tell the age from the serial number like you can the HP equipment. On the HP gear, there's a three digit serial number. The very first digit is the year plus 60. And on a four digit sections of the serial number, the very first section, if it's four digits, you use the first two digits. And you add those onto 60, which is 1960, which tells you the year. So if it said, you know, there's a three digit number said 567, it'd be 1965. But so now the same thing can be said for the flukes, so I don't know if it's got the same system or not. If you do know, let me know. The first thing we should do is pull this thing apart and actually have a look at it. Now it's got these seals on it, which could be from the seller. Tektronix Service Solutions. So this is a Tektronix seal. That's been put on by Tektronix. On these two here. There's nothing on the top piece and on the bottom has got another one over here, different type. So if I can leave those intact I will. Hopefully I can leave those intact and set the top off. It looks like there used to be one on the top. You can see the remains of a calibration seal there. Someone's already been in this at some point or the seal's got taken off for some reason but maybe it's got a fault when I try to have a look at it. Maybe it's an empty case. So let's open this thing up and see what we're actually dealing with before we try and do anything else. Cause, well, I've got to change that sock on the back anyway because as it is right now I just cannot use that. I need to do something about adapting it to make it usable for me, you know, put a IEC sock on the back or something. I'm not quite sure what I'm do with that yet. So I do like about these flukes, they all seem to have it. These, this era, they've got these quite cool screws like self-tapping screws and they use little metal inserts on the inside. which are easy to deal with. So just insert here like this. Quite like those. So what we're dealing with here, we've got some Phillips caps that are always suspect. We've got some things here which are some kind of transformers. There's a film cap there which is probably going to be fine. We've got some socketed transistors. We've got some old carbon composite resistors which could be problematic. There's another one, well, a few more over here. They could be bad. There's a 115 volt marking here for that link and 250 volt here we go so this is where we change the voltages just over here so we've got two links here saying 115 and then there's a 230 volt link is supposed to be in there so that needs to be changed around so he's on side one side swing around put it back into the board over here and so for that one swing that one down that'll make it 230 volt that changes the windings on this transformer here most likely right, we'll go from parallel windings to series windings to go between the two and the rest of it is inside a shielded box. Let's take this top cover off. And there's heaps of room in the back cover. Yeah, actually, there's loads of room there. So that looks like it actually pop out. Yeah, that's good, actually. That looks like it's going to be easily changeable. No, I can't get the cover off very easily. So hopefully there's nothing too serious in there. That's going to be a bit of a tricky one to get out. There's screws down there, on that side, one this side, at the back, which I'd have to get to in order to get that panel out. I mean, it's not impossible to get to them. It might involve removing this assembly here and just undoing just like the screws top bottom. You take those out and then this assembly will be able to move out of the way. But the shaft will look like it's going to be a problem as well. Got a switch shaft comes through. Now that's actually got a slotted hole in it. It probably doesn't, doesn't show up too well in camera, but it's actually a slotted hole. So that can actually stay in place. You don't have to take the shaft off. You can just lift it off over the shaft. But obviously getting to these screws in the back here is a bit trickier. Not impossible, I mean I do have an angled fitting, I could probably get any of the right angle and get them out that way. But I think we can look at this first and do a power supply switch over. Look at changing the socket. Looks like I can just unplug that one and just take it out. I do love the modularity of fluke stuff, this era. It's all modular. You know, I do love that. It does such a good job on it. Oh, we'll have to take the bottom panel off to get it out. Which means breaking the calibration seal. So be it. There we go. 
also gives a better look on the inside here. And we've got another assembly here, which I can't do anything with either. No. So there's a big capacitor here, the size of that one. Big film cap. It's going between the casing and the uh, guard terminal. So it's obviously for the guard shield. There's also another big cap there, which is going where? I'm not quite sure. It's going from the guard terminal somewhere else. Let's have a look at that. I'm sure it's on a circuit diagrams anyway. Can't see which channel it's going to. It might be going to the input, I'm not sure. Could be going to the common more, more likely, but it's hard to tell. So this is what I'm hoping here. You see the back of this, it's got a few wires going to it. And the earth is going through this little thin wire to the board over there. I'm not keen on that, but... Oh, that's why it's fell off. That's nice. <laughs> Definitely I'll fix it now. But yeah, what I'm looking at here is that this looks like this could be squeezed out with some poly grips or something like that maybe. And get that out and that might be the same cutout size for an IEC connector, if we're lucky. Over here, it's been pointing out to me by someone in the chat that there's screws missing from here. And that is indeed the case. You can see the where there used to be the washers in there. And just here there's two wires have been clipped off. The battery plus and minus have been clipped off. Because this used to have a battery pack in it at some point, okay? And that's obviously been removed. There must have been inside that passage in there. So these screws must have been holding in the battery pack. It'll be in the service panel, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll mention it in there. So yeah, that's what I think's happened. The battery pack used to be stored in the bottom part behind this panel, and that's been unremoved. And they probably had the wires passing through here, through that hole there, to the battery pack. In a way, it's a relief. The battery pack's not inside it, because... At this age, the battery pack would likely be leaking and absolutely useless anyway. But you may be surprised, but it's very unlikely to still be functional. On the bad point is that now I don't know what a battery pack actually is. I'm sure it mentions it in the manual somewhere, on the circuit diagram, something like that. It must be mentioned about what the voltages are and what have you. I'm going to have to look at making something to go with that. For the time being, I need to disconnect all this, get this socket out of here, and see if I can put an IC in the same place. Alright, so I found a terminal which is gonna kind of fit it's not perfect it's a narrow format and it won't quite fit horizontally in here like that but it will fit vertically so if I put it in that way around like that you'll see it'll fit vertically inside the, the panel here like that so it will go in there but obviously in that orientation instead which isn't really that big a deal I do normally like to have them that way up though but what this means is that this has got a built-in fuse holder and what I'm hoping to do is basically is replace this bit only and drop that in. But because it's got a built-in fuse holder, it's going to be using that fuse rather than this fuse. So I could probably remove that and plug that up with a grommet or something and not have that bit used and just have this one in there. So all this is going to strip off. Now it's got these filter capacitors in here. It doesn't say anything about being wire class, although there would be wire class caps because they go in between each connection and earth. So they would be wire class, effectively. But these are probably micas or something, aren't they? Alright, it's taking a fuse holder out. I shall keep this because it's a perfectly good fuse holder. Or the old. You never know, I might get a piece of gear one day which doesn't actually have the inner piece of the holder. This piece. These do go missing sometimes. So I shall keep it because it would be good, even just as a spare part for that. So this leaves me these two holes. So what I'm looking at is orientations for this. Now, if I went that way with it to keep it horizontal, I'd end up maybe with a bit of a gap one side I've got to cut a lot more off and this will overlap this big hole which is going to be no good so that's not really going to work too well that way right so this one thing about putting it this way up because I've only got to cut out a small piece each side to make it fit I'm not too worried about the cutting really but you know I'm just cut those out to suit then all I've got to do then is put a grommet in here to plug that up and that'll be good I'm sure I've got something which will fit in there worst case you can put a small bolt in there a really short little bolt little stubby bolt and bolt that shut so it's completely covered because you don't want to be poking things through there or it remains nearby yeah I've got to trim this out get my nibbler hopefully my nibbler can do the job so I've nibbled that out now that now drops through that looks reasonably good happy with that so I fitted the grommet in here I had an assortment and I had one which fits in there really nicely so I'm happy with that that's a nice good fit that's plugged that hole up for the fuse holder now I need to get my drill and drill these holes out I probably have some shakeproof washers somewhere, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to put some thread locker on them. So 
I'm not putting them right down yet because I put a thread lock in there and then tighten them up. So I was looking at the other thing of this thing, so the natural diagram shows the ground connection going to the ground, right? Which is fine, it's what you expect, and it's got other road references and things like that. The battery here going to ground. But interesting, the ground doesn't actually go to the chassis, it goes straight to a PCB. So I'm actually thinking I should add a second ground point to go to the chassis to make sure it does have a good earth, because it's earth wise going to a PCB and then travelling across, and then somehow obviously gets to the chassis at some point. Which isn't ideal because if you've got an earth fault, it could essentially burn a track out and that's your earth protection gone. So I think I should actually stick a earth link directly from the socket to the chassis on one of these bolts. So I made a little earth link up here because I'm going to solder that directly onto the terminal. I'm just going to put some Loctite on here. I don't actually have any shape proof washers which would be ideal, like little star washer things. I haven't got any, I need to get some. So I'm just going to rely on bolting it down nice and tight. And I was putting some of this behind onto the actual shaft so the bolt itself has got it. I'm trying not to get it in between this, between the actual spade terminal or the ring terminal and the casing because you want a good earth connection there. I'm going to do this up as tight as I can. Okay, it's nice and tight. It's not pulling off. Just tighten this one down. Obviously these bolts are way too long. I would have preferred something shorter but this is what I've got. Okay, click. I should say click, shouldn't I? <laughs> Alright, that's the hardware part done. I've just got to solder this together with these other wires. We refit that, then we can try pairing it up. This earth wire, which was going to the earth pin on that socket on the back there, this is an important aspect to think about. On the circuit diagrams it shows it going to chassis, right, as earth. As an earth reference. Well, if I'm touching the chassis here, I've got nothing there. Go to the internal chassis here, I've got nothing there. So that is actually not earthed to the chassis, which means it doesn't actually have a safety earth as such. But if you look at the front panel, we've got the earth terminal here. All right, that's actually marked as an earth terminal. That is going to that green wire, so if I touch the green wire to the terminal again, touch onto here, now you have an earth. All right, so that's actually where it goes to. But obviously, it travels through the PCB on that rear section there, through the traces, which I don't like, because if it was an earth fault, like I said, one of the traces could burn out and then you've got no earth protection whatsoever. This is obviously reliant on having an external earth plugged into it in the front panel. Now I'm not happy with that for a mains power cord, so I'm certainly am happy to do it this way with a mains input. Obviously when you have the mains disconnected and you run it for battery, then you are reliant on using that front input terminal for the chassis. So that ground, or well, the earth there, doesn't go to anything else. It doesn't go to the guard on this one, or the common on this side, or the input that side, right? It doesn't go to any of those. It doesn't go to the chassis up here either. That's floating. Right? So that green wire isn't connected to anything on the actual casing, which is a electrical hazard in a way. Um, I'm sure they've done it for a reason, because you want that flexibility of having the earth connected or not. But for safety, I need to go through that plug on the back. And then if it's running with batteries, you plug an earth connection in here. But then the hazard's not really there apart from the equipment you connect to it. So, less of a problem then. But running off mains, it should have an earth casing. Because it's not double insulated like it should be for a non earth device. It's just a safe thing. You don't want to electrocute yourself on the casing if something goes wrong. That's a little trick. If you ever get these terminals or anything like this, you're trying to solder it and the solder just doesn't stick to it, give them a scrape. Because it's usually got like a nickel coating or something on it. And getting it scraped off gets you down to a copper or some other substrate which the solder will stick to and if you need to put more flux on wiring done apparently this thing only uses three watts normally and six watts when recharging a battery depending on the battery uses I suppose but I don't actually have a battery pack so most is going to be using three watts apparently I've put in some 100 milliamp fuses those are the smallest ones I've got so I'll put those in there and hopefully that'll be suitable fuses done no, I should have done spot heat shrink on those. Too late now, it's done. Forgot about it. So I must forgot to install the Y class caps on the back here to replace the originals. So I'm just doing that now. It's quite important to have filter caps on things. So let's check the other thing. Now I've got that panel back installed. It's not an ideal situation with the actual mountings I've got on this thing. So from the earth pen to the panel here, and yes, we have an earth there. To this panel here, we don't. So, to that screw we do, 
to this screw. We do. So the actual chassis is earthed, but this panel here has not got a good connection to it. Check this panel. Yep, that's good there too. 0.1 ohms, which is probably basically lead resistance. Yeah, 0.1 ohms, so it's like no resistance at all to the chassis on those parts. Uh, let's check somewhere else. So front panel should it be an earth because it's the original wiring. Yep, that's there. Nothing else on those. Yep, that's, those are all isolated switches and stuff anyway. Let's try this screw down here. Yep, getting 0.2 ohms there. 0.1 ohms there. So yep, it's got an earth. That's fine. The chassis now has an earth. So I'm happy with that. Now, I've got to change voltages before I forget. Don't have magic smoke coming out. Or do we? No, no, we don't. We don't want magic smoke. So jump is here, so unhook them. I'm just going to spoon them around and drop in the other holes. Haven't read the manual, but it must be how it goes. It's usually pretty simple stuff like this. And these tweezers are absolutely knackered, but that's why I don't really mind leaving on them. Because they're not very good tweezers. They've had their day. But, uh, that's why I use the levering out things, because it doesn't matter. You know, I'll get that in and then I'll come back. Alright, let's power this out for the first time and see what happens. I've got a shunt in here, just a zero ohm, like a jumper. Just to link the input so there is no floating voltages which could you know peg it or whatever it's going to do i've got no idea how this works i haven't read the theory of operation or anything like that it's going to be a surprise for all of us power on switch is currently in opposition no power being consumed as expected that's a good start let's turn it on now drawing half a watt with 0.4 watts which seems okay I guess there is no apparent life by changing that okay well let's pull this out let's hook up the PDVST mini and see if we've got any kind of life out of it in fact it's only drawing 0.4 watts when it said it draws 3 watts. That's a little bit interesting. The power supply could have problems. We'll see if there's any life in it first and then we'll go from there. 1 volt is going in and there's no activity. Yep, she's dead Jim. So we have some stuff to fix. So I need to investigate the power supply which is all in the back there and figure out what's going on there. So these transistors are on little sockets, so I'm just going to reseat all these just to make sure that it's not like a bad transistor connection or something like that that's causing problems, because that does happen. So the supply has a full bridge rectifier over here, which is in the main supply. There's also a half bridge here, which splits off. That is doing the battery charging circuitry, it comes down to the battery only. So the half bridge is the battery charging, the full bridge is the actual power supply. So we need to look at those and verify that's all working correctly. Now it comes over here, it's got this little switching thing here, which is obviously switching the power supply, which has then got neons over here, yay, neons. And then it's got this other supply which comes across, it's there, which is as two 15 volt rails. Also comes across over here, and to this transistor here. One it comes across is coming to another transformer, another switching system, another transformer which is doing, generating another supply, which is like something else which comes back comes back over here. Interestingly, that's actually coming back to these. Anyway, I don't know what that's doing. I'll have to figure that bit out. So we've got some voltage we need to check, which unfortunately these ones are inside this metal can. So those aren't easy to access. But I can check the stuff which is outside the metal can, which is these connections here. So we could check, make sure we've got voltages here. All right, so I'm gonna hook up to the DC supply instead. So the battery pack's been removed, but the connections are still there, so I can see where they go. So I've hooked up the power supply, set to 9.4 volts, which should be just below the nominal battery pack voltage anyway. So it should still give us any indication. That way we can determine if it's a main system problem inside this box, because that 15 volt supply, a little chopper thing in there, inside there, it's all off that supply. We'll try that first if on the DC supply. If that doesn't work, then we know we've got a problem inside the box. If it does work, then we know we've got a problem in the main power supply, which is not unsurprising with capacitors and stuff like that. But the fact it's completely dead is probably not a good sign. But we'll give it a go. Let's turn the power on here. We've got a current limited 
battery check function is showing us battery okay right on the top end so that's a good voltage check so we've got some life there from that and we'll turn it on we've got some activity now that could have just been because of the battery check changing over let's disconnect that so I'm going to get too excited just yet put the PDVS2 mini in this is on the 1 volt range so 1 volt and the PDVS2 mini, hey look at that, it's working excellent right, so the power supply is obviously the problem 1 volt on the PDVS2 mini and we get exactly 1 volt on there, that's brilliant so let's do 100 mini volts it's looking about right I'll try and get it more straight to you so 300 millivolt range so it's on the 3 scale now, so it should be on that line, it is 100 millivolts should be full scale it is right, let's do 10 millivolts it's on the first line 30, should get on the 1 it is oh, too far, 10 should be full scale and it is 1 millivolt so on the 1 on the three, yep, it's on the one there. One millivolt, full scale, it is. One of microvolts. It's on the one, just about. Don't forget angles slightly off still. Three scale, so it should be on the one, we are basically are. And 100 microvolts. It's just over full scale, so it's slightly high. 10 microvolts. So we was reading slightly high there. On the 3 it was also reading high. And the 10 there is also reading high. So, But it could also be because I have the covers on. It could be inducing noise from the lighting. Because these lights are all LED based and they've got switching supplies and stuff on them. And there is a lot of electrical noise here. So it could be that. But it is actually functioning. So let's do that. Let's go to a higher voltage now. So that's one volt and three volt range, yep. Three volts, that's good. Ten volt range should be about three, yep. And ten volts as high as I can go on this thing. And that's bang on. And on the 30 volt range, it's right there. So it's actually looking like it functions, that's good. But obviously we've got a power supply problem. So more things to fix, which is brilliant. I like things to fix. Yep, I forgot about the zeroing thing, so I've just done a zeroing on this. We'll try a very low level again. So that's 10 microvolts. Look at that bang on, that's with the zeroing. Brilliant, that's actually looking good. The 10 microvolt range, it's basically full scale. I'll zero that out again on here. We'll zero this. You see it jumping around very slightly, a little bit flicker. Operate mode, just drop down a little bit. We'll try that. 10 microvolts on here, 10 microvolts on there. Look at that perfect, and it's got a little bit of wobbling in there. It's always picking up some ambient noise, but that's as large as I'm going. This thing that's working well, excellent. All right, so the power supply in the, in the back here has definitely got a problem because DC input is working fine, AC input is not working fine. We can check for capacitors for start. I've already checked the discharged. So 4.9 ohms, 507 microfarad. This is a 470. It looks like 25 volt from what I can see. So 4.9, let's check it again. 1.29, that way it sounded slightly better. Let's do it again. 0.93, let's check it again. 3.3, it's probably just bad connections. Let's probe into here like this get it into the actual lead hole and push it on hard and the same on that one there you go, 0 0.9, 5 on 10, that one actually looks right so I'll do the same on this one, we'll probe onto the actual lead holes so we get a nice good connection get into it what have we got there? 483 at 0.3 ohms and that's a 6.3 volt cap. This is a 470, yep. Those two caps are just tested, are okay. Well, let's test all the diodes to make sure they're okay. 
and we might as well check the transistors while we're at it whilst we're in diode mode, might as well just do it so that's ok, it's charging capacitor up, that's fine that's fine fine fine, other way around fine 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 all good, that sort of diodes let's quickly poke some transistors I don't know what the pinouts are, I haven't even looked, don't know what they are. There you go, got a junction that way. Junction that way, that one looks good. Just assume the same pinout on this one. Junction that way. Junction that way. I'm just going to assume the same pinout for all of them, because they might be the same parts, I really don't know. That is not. Could be a PMP versus MPN. Yep, it's looking that way. Yep, that looks good. Looks good. So on service, the transistors look good as well. No obvious faults there. Okay, let's check some resistors. Just make sure there's no open resistors. Let's check some basic stuff. It's just quick and easy checks to do. Nice and simple. So this one here. 9.5k and it's marked as 9.53k and that's exactly what we're getting that's a really good vista isn't that one and there's carbon films, these are always the ones which you have to worry about 41 ohms so orange is the 3 I think that's white so it's 3.90 390 yeah that's 2 ohms up, probably ok this one's brown, green, brown 156 ohms. I think it's a brown. Maybe it's not a brown, maybe it's an orange. So it could be slightly, yeah, it's, it's maybe slightly high, but okay. Not looking too bad. Can't see the colours on this one yet. 5.6k. It's that green, brown, red. So that looks pretty close. Of course, I'd look at the diagrams as well and see what these actually are. 4.9k, call it for that one. 4.8. And that's green, brown, red again. And these other ones over here are very, very orange, these two down here. 24k. 24k. So I think that should be 22k, so they're slightly up. So I quite often see these old carbon composite resistors. They're usually up by 10%. Quite surprisingly. It's almost consistent. It's always almost 10%. Or completely gone, you know, miles off. But they look reasonable, they're, they're not too far off, so nothing horrendous there. Let's get the switch a clean. Right, okay, let's try this again. Now, I've cleaned the switch up with a bit of Deoxid D5, just put in there, work the switch a bit, and obviously we tested all the components on that board, the obvious ones anyway. Could still be a transform problem or some other thing, so we'll try it again. Put it onto line operation. We're drawing about the same power, so it doesn't look like it's anything different now. It looks exactly the same behaviour, so I don't think the line switch is the problem. I think something else is going on. May require some further investigation. So it's on the 1 volt range, I think. It's around there somewhere. Put 1 volt into it, nothing happening. Power supply section seems to be completely dead. Well, not completely dead, there is some power being used, but... I don't know where it's going, it's not going into the here. So that's going to require a bit more look, a bit more of a look. So the wire only goes into that panel is from this section here. Right? So it could be that these aren't switching, these transistors, or there's something wrong with this adjustment here maybe. That's possible. But we can check the wiring here to see if we've got any AC lines coming out. I'm actually wondering if these lines here are from the battery supply effectively. Not sure what the story is exactly with this bit. That's feeding into these to switch those ones. That's an input. Oh no, that's a parallel supply then. That's just doing parallel switching up here. Okay, we'll ignore that bit. This section is switching this, but the battery, when it's on battery mode, is controlling the same circuitry. Okay, so that eliminates quite a bit actually. So looking at this bit a bit more logically, 
battery comes in here. This battery circuit from this point is working. So that means everything from this point downwards will also be working. So it has to be before this point. Okay, so it has to be a problem on the power supply board. And there's not much there. We check the diodes. There could be an issue with this transformer. It's possible that there's an issue with that or potentially one of these resistors here are bad. I think I checked those ones, didn't I? Those are on the back board, so I think I've already checked those to make sure they look about right. 39 ohm, I did see that one. I saw 41, didn't I? So, yeah. Um, I checked both those positions. That eliminates both those resistors because they both did the same thing. I checked both positions. Didn't matter which resistor I went through, it didn't work. So, that doesn't leave much. That leaves the bridge and the supply going to the bridge. If I put it in battery operate mode, it'd be running off the other winding. It'd be running off this supply, off that different bridge. If I put it in battery operate mode, it'd be running off this bridge instead of this bridge. It might behave differently. We haven't tried that yet. So we'll turn the power back on. Battery check doesn't show anything. Okay. No. So that doesn't seem to affect it. Okay. There goes that theory which probably means it's before this point, which means it's likely to be this T201. So it's consuming some power. It might mean the primary side is okay, but the secondary side is open, that's possible. Let's do some tests. Just now I checked all the primary and secondary windings on this transformer here, which is the T201, which is the main one that comes in. They seem okay, there's nothing obvious there. I'm gonna do some voltage checks on actual diodes to see what voltage is getting across the diodes. Let's see if we get anything there which looks about right or not. I don't know what we're supposed to be getting, but um, we'll figure it out. Probably in recording this. So between junction of uh, CR201, 202, and junction of CR204 and 203, with a switch in power mode, like on, running mode, I should be seeing a voltage there. I'm getting absolutely nothing. There's no power going to those diodes at all. So now I'm going to check the secondary of that power supply. So this is in line operate mode right, right now. So that should be providing power through that switch. Line operate mode should be going through that switch and into that transformer. So I should be able to see power on the input of the transformer and the output of the transformer. So we'll start in the secondary first, see if there's anything there. Which is the bottom two connections, I believe. Stick one there, stick one there. We're getting 21 volts AC. Great, the transformer's actually generating something which makes us even more curious. So the transformer is working on the output, 21 volts. That's interesting. So what I can probably do then, is connect up to the, the junction of CR204, CR202, wherever that is, which is that end. This is the AC side, one side of the AC side there, right? and then I can check R201 and R202 to see if there's any voltage on those. This is R201. Nothing that side. Nothing that side. I'm not sure which one it's supposed to be using. Nothing that side. Nothing that side. Check that one. Nothing. That's 207. Where's 202? Is that there? Oh, well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 202 right there. So, between there and here. Nothing there. Nothing there in that mode. Change the switch around. Nothing. Nothing. Change the battery side. Battery operate mode. Nothing. Nothing. And nothing. There's no power at all coming through that switch. We got a problem with the switch. I think I found a problem. I was just soldering one of those bottom pins and the pin moved into the hole and so did that one. So there's two pins which are just moving around. I'll show you which ones I mean. So right here you've got these two bottom pins. This one here. See that's moving. And this one here. They're not connected anymore. That could be it. So what I'm actually thinking is that this wafer has been twisted and stressed because I've, I've been looking at this the whole time thinking that doesn't look quite straight. 
You look at these legs, these top legs are straight, all right? They actually go in line, pretty much in line, okay? And this one here is off at an angle. It's twisted slightly sideways. And these ones are twisted off sideways by quite a bit. So I think someone's taken this board out, or taken that assembly out of that chassis, and as they've been trying to get it out, they've twisted it on this shaft here, and they've levered on this wafer, which has then broken those two legs. So I think this wafer's been molested a little bit, and I think I need to just fix those two legs there, and I think we'll be good again. So what I'm gonna try doing is get this little wire off a component leg, right, right through whole component leg, probably for a capacitor, likely from a capacitor. And I'm gonna do is desolder the other side with the soldering iron, the one which has basically fallen off, try and poke this through the hole from this side, so it's soldered on the other side, and then I can form it around on this side and try and solder onto the tab on the switch on both of those, and that should allow me to fix it. Okay, there you go, it's poked through. And there is the lead, which has fallen off. Probably can't see it. There you go, there's the lead. There's the switch leg. So that is definitely gone. Can I set wire in? So I'll repeat the process of the other one. So that's the two wire leads in there. Now I can bridge those over to the switch and hopefully fix it. So I form those wires around. As you can see there, set it in position. This wafer is still very slightly wonky. I'm not completely happy with that, but I don't want to strain it up all the way. It seems to be handling that angle okay. Um, it's not ideal, but I don't want to bend it too much. If I bend it up, it might actually end up breaking more legs off. So I'm going to leave it as it is and just cut my losses for that part. So I'm just going to put some flux on this stuff to try and help it to solder. I'm going to try and solder onto those studs there and also onto the legs here. So flux on there as well. Right, the flux is obviously to try and help it to take solder nicely because it is quite old. Alright, so here we go. Wish me luck. <laughs> that seems to go onto the leg quite nicely actually. The rivet may not be necessary. I'm using quite a high heat here to try and help this to go. It's actually sold on the legs quite nicely. I might leave the rivet alone. The legs look fine. They've actually gone alright. Let's clean up the connections in the back here which I did before. That I think will now work. So now I know that if it only draws 400 milliamps on the AC input side, that the transformer is working, at least the primary side of the transformer is working, but there's not getting any further than that because of this switch problem. So that's the thing to note. If you're only getting that kind of current on it, then that's what the problem is. So let's see what we get. Now I've done those connections and cleaned it up. I reckon it will probably work now. Let's shove a jumper in here. Just to short that out, power on, line operate on, hey, needle moved, looking promising, and that's drawing 1.5 watts. <coughs> it might go a bit crazy until it actually finds itself, there we go. That's looking good. I reckon this will be working just fine now. I think we should do one more check. So let's do some tests on here now. So I think this is the AC side here between this connection and this connection. So that is not AC. That's not what I was expecting. I really expected that to be AC. Oh, well, never mind. Let's find the AC ones. I'll <laughs> figure this out. There's one here and another one here. They should be DC. And they're not. And that should be battery. There we go. There's battery supply on that side. You got something, right. Get 6.4 volts there. And charge, 6.4 volts. And charging, you're getting 7.9 volts on that side on the battery circuit. On operate and charge. Because I was splitting between here, that diode there, and that in there, which is CR203 linked up to CR201, right? on the positive sides of those 
Yes. So that should be AC on that side, right? And between CR204 coming across the CR202 on negative sides of those, that's the AC side there. So between here and here, I should be measuring AC, but I'm not I'm measuring DC. I'm thinking there's something weird going on here. 12.6 volts DC. Um, I need to look at this more. This isn't right. So I think I figured out what's going on here. So I've marked this board up, say so the dot is AC, the D should be DC, and the B is for battery, right? You can kind of just see the B's there. I did this based on the component marking versus the diagram. It looks like CR203 and CR202, these two markings here, are swapped over, either on the diagram or on the PCB. That's actually CR202, and that's CR203, the other way around. Which explains why I wasn't getting the right readings in the right places. So if I measure now between here and here, you're getting 12.55 volts AC. If I measure across that diode, you're getting 6.6 .6 volts AC. That's fine. If we've got a DC mode, which should be across that one, 6.2 volts DC, that one there. 12.55 volts DC. Yep, so we're getting those voltages there, that's fine. And the battery one will be the battery one. 6.5 volts there, and to that point, 12 volts DC. So yes, reference voltages in case you ever need to know the voltages that are running on this power supply. So there we go, it seems to be working okay now. I'm debating recapping it or not. I'm inclined to leave it actually, because the caps and the power supply are absolutely fine. There's no borderline issue there. It's like, oh, they look a little bit on the high side. No, they look perfect. So. I'm inclined to leave my line and that this goes against everything I'd normally do. Right? Normally, if it's a power supply, especially if it's a power supply, if it's caps and it's old equipment like this, I'll just recap it regardless, even though it tests okay. I'm feeling lazy today. And I'm gonna do the unthinkable and not recap it. Oh! <laughs> so yeah, check out the other videos down below for repairs and things like that. Subscribe if you're not really subscribed, and over there is a Patreon support link if you want to help me to buy bits of test gear like this to do videos about. Catch you later.